Welcome back to History 101. My name is Christina Paris. I'm your instructor for this course. And this evening, we're going to be covering Chapter 18, Industry and Empire, 1890 to 1900. As usual, we're going to be breaking it up into multiple parts uh, to give you a chance. Let me adjust my camera here a little. Um, to take breaks because, as you know, I like to talk and I like to lecture and I know these uh, different parts of the lecture are very long and I do apologize for it, but as you can tell, I really enjoy the subject. I hope you're enjoying the lectures as well, um, as much as I like recording them. So anyway, we're going to start out, as we always do with these chapters, with an American portrait, this time J.P. Morgan. Uh, for many of you, or some of you perhaps, you, that don't know who Morgan was, he was a financier. And um, as we pretty much uh, previously discussed in the last chapter, um, during this particular period in time, um, in the 1890s, um, it actually started in the 1870s, the United States was going through a cycle of, of depressions. And I'm sure you're probably going, wait a second, wait a second, depressions? I thought that was until like the 1920s. Uh, actually, the cyclical thing that was going on with our economy um, was going on pre before in the 1920s. Um, and the depressions were getting more frequent, much deeper. And it's not until the 1920s that we realize um, in fact, the 1920s is really kind of the, the straw that broke the camel's back, per se. Um, because up until the 1920s, we have this idea, this concept about the economy that it's going to be a self-correcting thing. That the economy self-corrects, everything goes back to normal, everything's good. The 1920s totally changes our mindset about this, that the economy isn't going to self-correct. Um, that we have to do some kind of intervention to help the economy kind of right itself. Um, and we have to intervene. Um, we get this idea when this, I, this concept comes to being. Um, it's actually uh, George Maynard Keynes who realize, proposes that the economy isn't self-correcting we have to, our government has to intervene and actually kind of give it a nudge. And it's this concept that this intervention is necessary and in fact required to kind of push the economy out of this depression. Um, becomes known as Keynesian economics. And it's now this belief that we recognize of um, post-1930s uh, economic theory. It becomes known as Keynesian economics. Um, before it, it's classic e economic theory based off Adam Smith. I'm not going to get too much into that. You can take an economics course, learn all about the, the nuances of economic theory pre-1930 versus post-1930s. Oh, totally different kettle of fish outside of history. Um, but for the time being, that's as much as you need to understand to understand what's so significant about 18, the 1870s and 1890s. Because we're still in this mindset that the economy is going to right itself. However, between 1870 and 1890s, we're in some pretty dire straits. And in fact, as eight, the panic of 1893 sets in, the situation becomes dire. In fact, there's runs on banks, there's strikes going on, and the economy is getting so bad that it actually looks for a time that the United States economy teeters on the brink of running out of money. And it's J.P. Morgan, who's this great financial manipulator, that kind of steps into the situation. Now, Morgan kind of is this, I don't want to say he's a good guy. He kind of plays on the edge of things. He is one of these notorious figures. 
Uh, we talked about this reputation that um, Carnegie has, um, that Rockefeller has, of being called a robber baron. Morgan's right up there with these robber barons. Um, he's not exactly um, the best person. But at this moment, he steps in and he approaches the federal government and goes, you know, I've got enough money. Uh, I can make you guys alone. And I can kind of save the United States economy. And of course, the federal government's kind of like, hmm, private citizen. He's very wealthy. You know, he's got enough money, he can make us alone and keep us from the brink. Nowadays, we'd probably be looking and kind of going, should we or shouldn't we do this? There's a whole lot of ethical things nowadays. We'd probably go, yeah, that's really nice, but we probably shouldn't do that. But back then, we didn't have all those ethical constraints we have now. Um, you know, the, the economy is teetering on the brink of collapse. So they accepted his offer. And they did um, receive the funds from him. And he helped them kind of shore up the economy and stabilize things. And it did help stabilize at least the government. I'm not going to say it stabilized the whole economy. But it did stabilize at least the situation with the federal government, which at least kept things running with our, with essentially the chain of command, which was an amazing thing for a private citizen to come forward and do. Um, so it did calm, at least calm the markets, because you can imagine what kind of chaos, what kind of anarchy would have broken loose, how the, econ the markets would have collapsed if the um, federal government had gone bankrupt, if the treasury had gone bankrupt. And for a time it did look like that situation was going to happen. Um, now we do see and we do recognize with this move that businessmen are becoming increasingly more powerful. Obviously, um, with someone like Morgan being able to step in, intervene, and save the federal government, this is not something that would have happened even 20, 30, 40 years prior. Um, businessmen are becoming increasingly more powerful in the country, and this trend is going to continue. Now, is this going to have positive or negative con um, implications for our, our country. Obviously, there's going to be some, some consequences with this. As we're going to see moving forward, we're going to see that there are going to be some um, complications. And the biggest complication for this is going to be obviously with our economy. We're not going to see the ramifications of this for probably close to another 30 years. And I don't want to tip you off about what's gonna, what this is going to have, but you will see what I mean as we move forward. So with that, we're going to move forward and talk about the crisis of the 1890s. Now, the hard times and the demands for help. Now, we're going to move into talking about the World Columbia Exposition in 1893. Um, Chicago had high unemployment, poor housing. Now, you're probably wondering what, what the World Columbia Exposition was. Chicago had put on this amazing, grand um, exposition that was supposed to showcase the wonders of the modern era. Um, they built up this, these lavish, essentially, um, facade of the city. You have to remember that Chicago, just prior to this, had suffered the Great Chicago Fire. Much of the city had been destroyed. Um, so they rebuilt this new section of city that was gleaming, that was white, that's modernized, that's sophisticated, but on the other side of this is this desperate poverty um, that is shored up 
by this technological advance of Packingtown. Now, we've talked briefly about Packingtown. Um, we're going to be talking a little more about Packingtown moving forward. Um, I haven't told you the full story of Packingtown because we haven't get it, gotten really into talking about um, Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle. You may have read it. You may have heard about it. Um, but Packingtown is this essentially industrialized on a great scale um, slaughtering industrial complex of animals and cattle, pigs, whatever, um, and then essentially mass slaughtering of animals and taking every single part of the animal and industrializing this into the best way of utilizing every single component of these animals and then shipping it out. Unfortunately, what goes on in Packingtown is not the greatest conditions for animals, for the people that work in these slaughterhouses, and for where the animals and the people essentially reside between the animals being slaughtered and the people working to make sure that these animals are processed. Um, the conditions are dire and terrible and atrocious. Um, and this is what Sinclair actually brings to light in his book, The Jungle. And this is what is also behind the scenes of the World's Columbian Exposition. That's why I've taken this total sideways thing. We have people being laid off. We have high unemployment rates. We have people that during this time are going through um, terrible housing conditions. If you read the jungle, you know what I'm what I'm talking about. The the conditions are horrendous, absolutely appalling. Um, tenement housing. Um, I like to compare tenement housing to if you've seen uh, cases of slum lords um, in our big cities. Uh, I'm not talking about um, cases of really bad housing here in the Inland Empire. I'm talking about the slumlord cases that we see coming out of Los Angeles. Um, probably 10 times worse than the worst cases of slumlords. And what I mean by slumlords are people that keep, um, force people to live in situations where there's no sanitation or minimal sanitation. We're talking about toilets that don't work, sinks that don't work. Um, rat infestations, um, families, multiple families that are forced to live in um, apartments that have no heating, no air conditioning, where the windows are boarded up or the windows are broken out and not repaired, um, where there is known drug activity that's going on that's not resolved with police being brought in to evict the people. Take a situation like that in a building, in a tightly cramped, run-down, dilapidated building that's on the verge of being condemned, and then take that situation and make it about a hundred times worse, you have tenement housing. So yeah, it's awful, awful situations that these people were living in back in 1903. and oftentimes add into that, that they didn't have indoor plumbing in most cases. Um, the, the kind of plumbing that, if you call it plumbing, they had were what were called chamber pots. I think we've talked about chamber pots before in our lectures. Chamber pots were essentially a little ceramic um, cistern type thing, which is kind of like a little um, ceramic planter um, type de container 
that would sit under your bed. It usually had a handle on it to give you, so you could have a firm grip on it. You'd pull it out from underneath your bed, do your business in it, squat over it generally, and you'd take it out in the morning and you'd yell out the window to let people know what was coming out the window and you'd toss it out the window. And there were usually open gutters outside that all this stuff would run into. That was your sewer. I know you're probably all going, oh my word, I didn't need to know that. That's why disease was so rampant in those days. Um, that's, that explains a lot. Cholera, dysentery, um, all those nice little things. Typhoid, typhus. All these things were rampant because there were open sewers. Um, at least part of the reason. Um, then you had rodents that were running rampant that carried fleas that had uh, flea-borne diseases, uh, blood-borne diseases, um, which added um, bubonic plague was carried that that way. Um, the fleas and the that would bite you and they carried the disease and it would infect uh, people. We didn't understand the mechanisms of disease, so we didn't realize that it was these fleas that were actually sickening people. We thought it was other mechanisms. Um, so yeah, lovely, lovely situations. But again, I'm getting off topic. So anyway, we have this World Columbian Exposition that comes to Chicago. Efforts are undertaken to try to keep the world's guests who were coming to Chicago for the World's Columbian Exposition from seeing people um, begging at the gates. Obviously, with this World's Columbian Exposition, the belief was that there was an opportunity for jobs, which there were opportunities for jobs, but these jobs were quickly filled by clean, upstanding citizens, not the people that were coming out of Packingtown. These people were immigrants. These people spoke limited English. These people were seen as dirty, unclean. Um, obviously, Chicago's elite did not want this to re represent the city. They wanted the upstanding citizens to represent the image of the city. They made every effort with their police force that was unfortunately corrupt to make sure that these people were herded up, herded back, and kept away from the gates of the exposition to ensure that only the proper image of Chicago was maintained. Obviously, these images of poverty, destitution, um, these images of this horrifying sight of the tenements was kept out of sight, out of mind. And that's what they did. They did successfully. Um, people didn't know, at least for the time. We'll talk in a minute about what eventually did come up when reformers got into the tenements and started um, documenting and releasing to the public what was really going on in these tenements. Um, we did have industrial armies that were formed. Now, what was an industrial army? Well, Jacob Coxey is probably the most well-known. And interestingly enough, we do have a connection to Jacob Coxey and Coxey's army. These were men that actually made the decision. Um, Jacob Coxey formed this idea that due to the panic, due to the need for men uh, to go to Washington, D.C., to march on Washington, to demand uh, monies that were owed to them by the federal government for service, uh, especially um, in service to the country, um, that they would march on Washington. So what he did was he essentially encouraged men to join him um, to, you know, walk, get on trains, do whatever you needed to, and come with him and come to Washington. Well, it just so happens that in recent years, um, the last couple of years, an article turned up in the Colton Courier 
um, our local newspaper, um, that there was an army, a branch of the Coxie Army, that was from Los Angeles that spent a number of days gathering their forces here in Colton, at the Colton train yard. Um, and they were actually fed and supported by residents of Colton um, while their forces rested on their cross-country journey. Um, so it was kind of interesting to make this discovery that we did have a connection to Coxie and his army. So something to think about that even though we think we are very far removed from these ev events of history, that there is still a connection, a local connection to something that is national like this history event that you read about in your textbook. So. We then turn our eyes overseas because we're not just having struggles here. We're not just keeping our eyes on our own shores during this particular time period because um, we're starting to realize that um, we've expanded to our limits. We've reached our western shores. Um, you know, with the settlement of the Cherokee Strip, really the last western frontier, um, the last great expansion um, is through. So there becomes this great question, where are we gonna go next? What are we going to do? Um, so it's Frederick Jackson Turner who actually proposes that the new frontiers actually lay overseas. Um, and this ultimately leads us to the conclusion that we are going to have to develop our Navy. Uh, if we're going to expand overseas, we're going to need a strong Navy, a Navy force. Um, because do we honestly think that, you know, these other countries are just going to let us come in willingly. Um, we've already seen that those Native Americans were kind of, you know, they, at first they were pretty nice. You know, they, they moved willingly along. But eventually they got tired of us pushing them off their land. So we recognize that, yeah, some, some people out there overseas might be really nice to get along with at first, but eventually we might encounter some people out there overseas that might not be quite as nice. I mean, granted, you know, the English, they're, they, they were pretty nice to us, but how do we know that they're all going to be nice? So eventually we recognize that we're gonna to have to have a strong Navy. And then we realize that in addition to a, the Navy, we've gotta start thinking about imports and exports. I mean, how are we going to negotiate with countries unless we have a so-called bargaining chip. I mean, yeah, you can kind of say, you know, do you want to, do you, you know, do you want to, you, you want to trade stuff with us? You want to trade your goods with us? A country can just say, yeah, we'll, we'll just keep shipping stuff in your country. What difference does it make? We've got ships, we'll just ship them over. I mean, we know we've got welcome, we've got eager customers over there in your country. We'll just ship it into your ports. However, something called a tariff comes in very handy to have because all of a sudden we can say, well, you know what? You have to pay a tariff on those imports. And you know, if you agree to be our, our trading partner, 
you know, if you're not one of our trading partners, you have to pay X dollars. Say a thousand dollars for every thousand pounds of tea, just for instance. But if you're one of our trading partners, we can make that $250. That's a huge difference, right? That's just an example. Probably wasn't what the, the bargaining tariff was. But that makes a huge difference, especially if you're talking tons and tons and tons of imports. So the bargaining tariff became that so-called bargaining chip, that ace that we could pull out. And this was the Harrison-McKinley tariff of 1890. It was that ace that we used in our negotiations. Well, yeah, you could be our bargaining partner And we'll we'll let you you know we'll let you Im, import or as whatever you want, but if you're not, you're gonna have to pay these huge tariffs, and you know you're not you're not gonna make much when you get done paying all those tariffs. Now the drive for efficiency. Technology was advancing as a breakneck pace. We've already talked about how technology had changed. We've got machines that were transforming the way we were doing business, the way factories were operating. We're going to see things transforming very rapidly during this time period. Doesn't necessarily mean that labor is going to, at first, keep up with this pace. But we are going to see a phenomenon called scientific management emerge. Something proposed by Frederick Winslow Taylor. A concept called Taylorism. It's a method of, for maximizing industrial efficiency by systematically reducing the time and motion involved in each step of the production process. And this scientific system is ultimately explained in his book, The Principles of Scientific Management, which was published in 1911. Now the idea is fairly simple. You reduce down the number of steps involved in production. It takes this many steps to get to this line of production. It takes this many steps for a person to get this job done. So it takes this allotted amount of time. So a person has exactly 32 minutes to get this job done. That's the exact amount of time it takes. Not a second more, not a second less. Now, I have a question for you. Is this practical? Does this make sense? Do we know that human beings run like machines? I can tell you. As somebody who's worked in many different jobs, no. Do we know that fatigue factors in? Do we know that things happen, especially when we're working with machinery, that machinery can malfunction? Do we know that a supervisor can come around and delay us. 
any number of things can come up. We're not feeling well. We get distracted. We daydream. Our friend comes around, asks us how our day is. 35 seconds gone. Taylorism's good on paper, but in practice, is it, pra is it really truly effective? In all likelihood, no. Humans do not run like machines. And what about the inevitable, I have to go to the bathroom. My stomach is bothering me. Yeah, those things don't factor in. As I say, humans are not machines. We don't function as machines. Then we have the struggle between management and labor. Management and labor inevitably struggle. And this time period, it is a huge struggle. And one of the big things that breaks out during this time is the Homestead uh, Steel Mill Strike. Henry Clay Frick, who's the manager of labor at the steel mill for Homestead um, gets into it with the American Federation of Labor. Which forms to protect the um, men who are working, who actually unite or try to unite the workers at Homestead. And it gets very heated. They bring in strike breakers. It results in violence. Ultimately, There's a lot that goes down with Homestead that tragically results in lost lives, but not much ground is won for labor at Homestead. Then we have the Pullman strike. This time we have the American Railway Union led by Eugene V. Debs. Going up against the railroads. More violence ensues ultimately with an attempt trying to get the railroads to again try to win concessions in favor of the men working for the Pullman um, rail car companies. Now you're probably wondering what Pullman um, rail cars are. They are the passenger cars that are being used on the uh, railroads at the time. And there's a onslaught of men that are contesting the amount of hours they're being forced to be worked and um, that's what leads to the strike. Ultimately, again, more violence breaks out. This time they're bringing in straight strike breakers. They're bringing in Pinkerton detectives. Um, one of the rail car uh, rail yards is actually set on fire. I mean, again, with more violence, very little ground is got gained with for the um, laborers as a result of these strikes. It's more violence and men of uh, laborers losing their lives as 
the businesses are essentially gaining ground with putting down the strikers. We get ultimately to corporate consolidation. Now, mergers consolidated industries under control of a few men. We've already talked about this. Where we have the, ultimately, we see this starting movement towards the monopolies, um, the trusts, this kind of thing. We've talked about J.P. Morgan. Morgan being one of the more the uh, powerful men um, at the opening of this story, or I should say the opening of this chapter, um, how he becomes the storied rescuer of the federal treasury. Um, he's a very powerful financier. And he talks very clearly about how bankers should actually own industry because they have a clear sense of how um, they ultimately um, understand how finance works how business works, and how um, all these, these components work together, how trusts operate. Um, it's interesting to hear this comment be made about by J.P. Morgan because bankers do become very ingrained in business um, moving forward, and it does have dire consequences um, to our economy. Um, they do wind up playing a strong component within our bigger businesses. And it's not so much a direct component as much as a dark, um, much more underhanded component. And we will see what kind of a complication it plays when um, the stock market collapses in the 1920s, but I'm getting too far ahead of myself and giving away too much about what will happen. Um, also, we see the rise of U.S. Steel, um, which is this great amalgamation of many um, corporations. And U.S. Steel becomes a major powerhouse of a steel corporation that will dominate uh, the steel industry for decades to come, um, rising out of this era as well. So anyway, we're gonna move ahead into modern economy, and we're still doing well um, with this particular section of our lecture. So now we're gonna talk about um, currency and we're going to visit again the idea of gold versus silver. Now the dollar was based on gold and it was extraordinarily stable. We talked about the pot, the basing um, the dollar on the gold standard. Um, it was extraordinarily standard, uh, stable. It helped sell American goods in Europe. Um, it increased the money supply, um, which would reduce interest rates, make credit more available. However, there was a movement, a growing current at this point in time in the United States, especially with this economic struggle that people made it clear that even though the the money supply is the dollar is extraordinary sta extraordinarily stable they felt that the way to correct the economic upheaval the economic troubles was to print greenbacks uh, or coin silver they did not understand that by doing this, by flooding the economy with that much currency would not fix the situation. It would actually devalue the currency. It would destabilize the economy. Um, and it would actually cause the situation to worsen rather than improve. But what they saw was it would give people more currency, um, it would be like a panacea, so to see, 
uh, so to say, I should say, um, they thought that that was an answer, but it's not. It's like a, a um, band-aid on a gushing wound. Um, sure, it's going to momentarily look like it's absorbing the blood. Um, it looks like it's going to fix the issue. But once you go to take that Band-Aid off, when it's soaked through, it's going to rip the scab off and it's going to make the wound even worse. Um, and in many cases, it, it could potentially make the bleeding much worse. The same thing with greenbacks and coin more silver. It's going to destabilize everything. Um, it's going to add, um, it's going to do just like the Deutsche Mark did um, to Germany, um, where you flood the market with so much currency that the existing currency you have there loses its existing value and you wind up with a bushel basket full of Deutsche Marks that have zero value. Um, you can't do that. It has to be backed by something um, to have an actual value. Um, they did not recognize that. They thought it was the solution. And all they could see was the immediate thing of, well, you give people more money, they could spend more money, um, they'll have more spending power, they'll go out, they'll buy stuff. They didn't realize that they were actually defeating the purpose by doing it. It is a temporary fix only. It does not fix the real underlying problem of what was going on with the economy. So yeah, that's where the problem was. So we come to the cross of gold speech, which I will leave for the next part. So this is the end of the first part, so we will pick up with the Cross of Gold speech by William Jennings Bryan in the next part of the lecture. So I hope you've enjoyed this. So I will see you in the next part.